I'm 78 now and I've been investing for over 60 years. Uh, I bought my first share when I was 15, 16, uh, 45 pounds worth uh, of a company called Aviation and Shipping, uh, a company who owned one ship. Sadly, the ship went down and my 45 pounds went down with it. Uh, so uh, not a great start to my investing life, but I'm glad to say that things have improved somewhat uh, over the years. I grew up in Manchester. My father was a doctor. Uh, I did accountancy uh, and then I went into a, a Manchester stockbroking firm uh, originally called Henry Cook Lumsden, uh, which is now part of Brown Shipley. Uh, and of course, uh, being based in the Northwest, uh, I was obviously aware uh, of a whole range of uh, small quoted public companies. Um, many of those uh, that I first invested in have been taken over or have, uh, have disappeared. Um, but there are still one or two like Nichols, Nichols Vimto, uh, where I'm still an investor and have been for many, many years. And uh, the family uh, are invested in James Holstead, for example, which has been a great success story. So over the years, I've continued to focus on the small cap sector, um, believing that um, they're more interesting shares to, uh, to own and understand that the potential for growth is greater with them. Um, they tend to be rather more overlooked by the institutions and by analysts. So theoretically, there are greater opportunities. Over the years, I, I must have owned, I, sometimes I feel I've almost owned every share that is quoted. I've certainly owned hundreds of shares uh, and um, have been on the receiving end uh, of over 50 takeovers. Uh, companies like um, uh, Delcam, a uh, software firm uh, in Birmingham, very successful takeover, Fenner in conveyor belting, and very recently, more recently last year, an insurance, insurance um, services firm called Charles Taylor uh, and the defense firm called Tarsus. So overall, I've um, been receiving takeovers for four years. Uh, and of course, the, the history of um, corporate life uh, post-war uh, has been very much um, the, the taking over of the smaller firms by the, the larger firms. And I'm sure that that process will continue. In fact, I've gone on record as saying that um, I, I reckon that probably 60-70% of my current holdings over a 10-year period, looking ahead, will probably be taken over. When uh, PEPs, um, the precursor to ISAs, um, uh, were first introduced in 1987, uh, I recognised that there was a real opportunity here. Uh, at that stage, you could invest around £3,000 uh, in a PEP. Uh, but I've always used to um, take my own decisions uh, and to find a, a pet manager uh, who actually allowed one to take uh, one's own decisions at that stage was not easy. But in the end, I found Midland Bank uh, X and T executor and trustee and I set up a, a pet with them in 1987 and put, uh, I think it was about £3,000 uh, into PIFCO, which was a a small Manchester manufacturing and wholesaling electrical firm. Uh, and in subsequent years, uh, I invested more in PIFCO. It, it ticked all my boxes. Uh, it was a family controlled business. It had a growth, a growth record. It was paying dividends and it was cash rich. And a few years later, it was taken over by Sultan of the USA. And I'm glad to say I made a nice profit. Um, but over the years, of course, the amount you could put into a uh, a PEP and then uh, into ICE has, has increased. Uh, and indeed, uh, for many years, I put the maximum amount into uh, my PEP and then my ISA uh, and reinvested the, the dividends. So we had a compounding there. By, 19, by 2003, uh, I probably invested a total of uh, £126,000. Uh, and my portfolio then in 2003 was worth about a million pounds uh, and I became known as the, the first uh, ISA millionaire. And whether I was or not, I, I don't know, but um, no one ever challenged that particular title and it, it's remained with me uh, ever since. 
one of the things that I've always focused on over the years um, uh, are companies that actually paid dividends. Uh, I've always liked dividends for uh, obvious reasons, um, but also because the, the declaration or the payment of a dividend actually is an amalgam of, of, of three things. It, it, it represents the, the view of a company's board of, of the last results, um, their uh, belief uh, as to what they can pay out next year, because obviously uh, very few companies want to uh, pay a rate of dividend that they then have to reduce next year. And it also means that the company itself has the cash to pay that dividend, which is clearly a, a, a good uh, and positive sign. Now, I'm very much uh, an investor. Uh, I'm not a trader. I don't regard the stock market uh, as a casino. Uh, I believe that uh, investing is about buying a shares, buying a stake uh, in a, a good growing business and staying with it. Uh, and that's the, 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 the approach that so many of the world's leading investors actually do adopt. Um, Warren Buffet, for example, uh, or more currently, um, uh, the, you know, the Fundsmith, uh, Fundsmith approach, uh, very much uh, getting into something and rarely changing uh, one's holdings. And the big mistake that I think many investors do make is that they chop and change far too frequently. And of course, one of the problems is that modern technology, which enables one to have uh, uh, all one's prices uh, instantly uh, at, the, at the flick of a switch or press of a button, uh, means that one can very easily and quickly see uh, when, is, when one is making a profit. And I think modern technology in a way encourages that greater activity. Um, but I believe that uh, if you really want to build a successful portfolio over the years, then you do have to um, uh, stay with those companies and let them grow uh, and build your portfolio brick by brick. So it's a question of very much of taking the, um, the long view um, and um, uh, staying with good holdings. Now, looking back over the, over the years, um, there are a number of um, conclusions that, um, uh, that I've really drawn um, from my uh, life of, uh, of investing, which uh, I'd like to share. First of all, the key to successful investment is to avoid the losses. Now, you probably say, well, that's fairly obvious, isn't it? Um, it in, a way, in a way, it is. But what we mean by that is, uh, certainly in my case, I don't invest in uh, three or four sectors um, that uh, might involve a greater degree of risk. I tend to be a, uh, a fairly conservative investor. So I don't invest in startups. I don't invest in biotech stocks. Uh, I don't um, uh, invest in exploration stocks or indeed in construction stocks. Now, this is not to say that you can't make a lot of money in biotech, and many people do, but they're specialist areas uh, and best left to the specialists. And I regard myself as very much a, a, a general practitioner. So um, what really are my key recommendations, the advice that I would, would give and would share with, with uh, novice investors or fellow investors uh, from my years of, uh, of investing. Um, firstly, uh, I believe that one should always uh, invest on modest valuations. Uh, I, I don't invest on, on, on stocks normally where the price earnings ratio is, uh, is in excess of 20. And certainly there's no way that I'd be investing in stocks with price earnings ratios of 40, 50, a plus with, with zero dividend yields. Um, I describe that as like investing on the high wire. And if something goes wrong, there is, there is a long way to, to fall. Um, so investing initially um, uh, at, at, at modest valuation levels. Then um, investing in, in what I term proper businesses, that businesses that are, are properly stewarded. Uh, so I like to see the directors 
uh, or those running the business uh, with a with a big stake in the business. Uh, I don't like to see too much debt. Uh, I, I much prefer and have done very well over the years in investing in companies where um, they are what, what I term cash positive. Uh, and I like companies also uh, that, that are UK based and UK registered, um, satisfying UK corporate governance, but actually trade uh, on, a, uh, on a global basis. I also believe that uh, one should be looking for some optimism from the from the board uh, in their comments. Um, so a, a comment, uh, the chairman's comment that ends up by saying we're now well positioned uh, to benefit when the next economic upturn takes place, more or less sends a signal to me, well, there's not a great deal to go for. Um, but on the other hand, you know, comments like exceeding expectations or, or believe that we will see and experience as a company very substantial growth uh, over the next few years um, uh, is, is a much more optimistic uh, backdrop um, to invest in uh, and invest on. Another mistake that I think many investors make is that um, they're put off uh, if the stock that they're a following or, or want to buy goes up a few pence. So maybe they might read about a particular share over the weekend um, and decide that uh, it, it's one that appeals to them. Uh, and um, let, let's say they see a price of 50p. Uh, but when they um, check on Monday morning, when, when trading opens, the shares are already 53, 54p. And, and therefore they decide you know, not to chase it. Now, in my view, if they really believe that that stock is a good stock to have, um, and unless the price rises dramatically, uh, then I believe one should go ahead and buy. Because you're buying, in my view, and, and my hope for 5, 10, 15 years on. And in 10 years' time, you're not going to look back and say, if only I'd bought that share at 50p rather than 53p or 54p. It, 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 it frankly is irrelevant. You, you will either have invested in a successful company uh, or not. So don't be put off by um, you know, very short term minor movements if you've actually decided that you really want to, to get aboard uh, a, particular, um, uh, a particular company. Um, it's really about, in my view, applying common sense to investment. You don't need to be a brilliant mathematician or have an accountancy background. You're applying common sense. So that is why, for me, uh, you know, I've given an indication of the sorts of companies that I like to invest in. But also, for example, you want a company with a stable board. Uh, if a company has, for the sake of argument, you know, two or three finance directors in five years, um, or the non-executive directors resign, clearly, clearly they're worrying danger signs. Another thing that I strongly believe in is in having a limited portfolio. Uh, I don't believe for one minute that, that uh, one should have a portfolio with 40 or 50 different holdings. You can't possibly believe that all those companies you're invested in are, 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 as, are, are as good uh, as your as your best. So I believe that focusing on maybe uh, 15, maybe even less 12, 15, 20 companies in one's portfolio uh, is actually uh, far more far more sensible. I don't believe in over diversifying. I think if you if you uh, invest in 40 or 50 stocks, some will go up, some will go down, some will get nowhere. And I don't believe that's the way to, to actually build up a, a, a large and successful portfolio, which has to be the aim. Also, when you have a smaller number of holdings, I think it's easier to get to know that company well. And um, certainly in my case, uh, I well, historically, I used to attend a lot of annual general meetings. Uh, I certainly try and talk to uh, chief executives or, or chairman when I can. Uh, and uh, so you, you, you do understand the, the, the motivation, what's driving those individuals who are building the business. 
As far as annual general meetings are concerned, which most investors regard as a, as a, as a rather sort of pointless formal exercise, attending an AGM uh, is not about um, the, necessarily the formal part of the evening or the, of the event, um, because normally, normally resolutions go through um, fairly, uh, fairly easily. But usually after the AGM, the whole board stays around maybe over coffee or, or, or drinks or a buffet. And one has an opportunity to talk to them and, and meet them as individuals. Uh, and I believe that it helps you assess a particular company uh, because assessing a particular business or company is, in my view, is rather like building up a jigsaw of the, of the business. Uh, and the more pieces you can put on that jigsaw, um, the better one will be uh, one's overall um, performance. Now, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Uh, you never stop making mistakes. Um, I've not come across uh, an, an investor who's never made mistakes. Uh, by and large, people are, uh, are happy to talk about their successes and, and their failures, but we all have failures and we all have regrets. I mean, for example, I remember um, uh, owning Avon Rubber when the shares were about a pound. Uh, I remember going down to their AGM, uh, quite a nice little solid business, um, but nothing terribly um, exciting. Uh, they were just beginning to develop uh, respirators for the, um, uh, for the armed forces. Uh, defense against chemical and biological attacks and similar uh, but that business was very much in its infancy and um, for whatever reason I can't remember I sold the shares um, at around a pound uh, I think today they're about 40 pounds or something like that or, or, or maybe even more it's been a, a huge success story um, but I'm talking more um, when I talk about mistakes about where one has bought something and actually, uh, the price then goes down. Now, I do believe, uh, and, and I've only come to this relatively recently, that if you've got something wrong and a price moves down, uh, I think, say, 20, to a 20% level below the level you bought, um, then unless there's a very strong reason and you really believe in that company, you should um, sell and take that loss uh, on the chin and... Uh, and move on. I think one of the one of the worst mistakes investors can make is to actually hold on to something um, because they paid a higher price for it, uh, and somehow convincing themselves that it will come right uh, in the end. Um, much better to to take that loss on the chin, not only in financial terms, but also in terms of if you don't uh, sell it. Every time you look at your portfolio. And you, and you see that particular company that's showing you a big loss, or you hear its name mentioned or in, in the, or see its name mentioned in the press or, 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 or its products mentioned, it pricks you every time. So to have a, a, a share that is losing money, losing significant amounts of money in your portfolio actually is debilitating and really um, knocks your confidence. So take it on the chin and get rid of it. The only, the only caveat, the only qualification to that is if the overall level of the market falls, um, you know, there's a major banking crash or uh, maybe another pandemic as we're seeing at the present time and, and markets really, really plunge, um, then uh, don't, um, you know, don't sell, the, the stop loss rule doesn't apply uh, in, 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 in those cases. Um, this brings me to a, another another point, and, and I believe this is very, very important. I don't think you should ever, ever uh, invest in the stock market on borrowed money. You should only invest your own money and money which you can afford to, to lock away and take the long view on, um, because events from, the, from left field can come along. I remember the um, secondary banking crisis in the 1970s when shares fell uh, to a level where real quality blue chips, major national companies were yielding, dividend yielding something like 20%, and no one would buy, no one would buy. Uh, you just have to go through that period, 
holding on to those stocks, taking the long view. Uh, and it's usually, it's usually uh, a great mistake to actually sell in those circumstances. If you're, if you're operating on borrowed money or the bank's pressing you, um, then you, you, you possibly do have to sell at those depressed levels. So really adopting a conservative approach, taking the long view, um, only invest uh, your, own, your own money. And remember that all equity investment uh, is, essentially, uh, is essentially risk. So to conclude, it really is a question of applying sense to it, common sense to investment, uh, taking the long view, recognizing that, that um, events from left field will come along from time to time, like the pandemic, for example, which no one could really, could really foresee, um, and living through those times and, and staying aboard. Uh, and uh, if you're hoping and expecting some of your shares to be taken over, um, it's rather like the, the lottery. You ain't going to win the lottery if you don't actually have a lottery ticket. So stay aboard those good companies that you have faith in. Uh, and uh, over the long term, uh, I'm sure that they will deliver. Um, so in conclusion, I, I would wish you every success in building your own portfolios. I've had a huge amount of um, uh, enjoyment and interest uh, over investing over the over the years. Uh, and uh, it's been a great, great hobby of mine. I'm glad to say in my case, it has now delivered a, a degree of financial independence, which is very much appreciated when you get to when you get to my age. Um, but I'm sure that uh, the opportunities in the future will be as, just as great, if not greater than they've been in the past. So uh, good luck and every success in, in your investing life. Thank you.